Hey everybody, this is Tom Sega from Duluth Pack, and this is the Duluth Pack podcast, Leader of the Pack. And our Leader of the Pack today is a special guest named Brooks Bergham. He is the co-founder and partner at Longwater, and we're going to learn today all what that means. Brooks, welcome to the podcast. That, thanks for having me here, Tom. Really, really excited to be here and, uh, and be part of it. I am so excited to, to learn a whole bunch more about private equity and all that you do and what goes into it. And how does somebody like yourself get raised? And then all of a sudden you're like, I'm going to found this my own company, but let's go way back and find out what a leader like yourself, what their growing up was all about. So where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> I probably, uh, I probably got a, a, a similar story to, uh, or, or a, a story that sounds a lot like a lot of kids that grew up in North Dakota. Um, so I grew up, I grew up in the town, the town of Arthur, North Dakota, a uh, town of 300 people. Um, and you know, it was, it was, it was probably, uh, to, to me, when I look back on it, I had an unbelievable childhood. I mean, grew up, you know, small town playing in the woods, you know, playing basketball, uh, you know, out, uh, outside with all my friends, you know, baseball in the summertime. Uh, it was, it was sort of a, sort of a classic, maybe you'd say American childhood or Midwestern childhood. And uh, it was, it was fantastic. And I, you know, feel lucky to have had it. So yeah, it was a great, great place to grow up. I think a lot of people, when they hear uh, a town of 300 people, uh, they might kind of recoil at that, but uh, it, was, it was, it was really nice. You could just tell them Mayberry. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. And so, and where exactly is that? Yeah, so uh, Arthur, North Dakota is located, e easiest pinpoint on a map is about 35 miles northwest of Fargo. Uh, and for people that then say, where's Fargo? I would say Fargo is about 250 miles uh, northwest of Minneapolis. So that's <laughs> sort of connecting all the dots there. Oh, come on. People know where Fargo is for crying out loud. And so, Brooks, where did you go to school what was your schooling? What did that look like? And then the transition from high school to college, where did you go? What did you get a degree in? Yeah, so I went to um, I went to school, um, obviously locally. I went to um, uh, my elementary school was six miles away in a, in a separate town of about 300 people uh, called Hunter, uh, North Dakota. Um, uh, and then I went to um, middle school back in Arthur. And then we combined schools at that point because there's been a lot of uh, combinations in rural North Dakota with school districts. So our schools combined, and then I went to another town called Argusville for a while, uh, and then we created a new school, uh, and then I went, and the new school was built um, actually out in the country. So then I went to a school that was not in a town. Uh, so that's sort of that's sort of the the, the background on my uh, my high school or elementary and high school experience. So you can give us all the stories on what happened on bu long bus rides. <laughs> that's right we had we had a lot of those for sure and then you go to uh und the university of north dakota yes yes and so for uh i would say for hockey fans or aviation nuts uh you pe people people generally know it um but but for those uh uninitiated uh yeah grand forks north dakota i uh, went to went to und uh, we were uh, originally uh, the we were, we were the Fighting Sioux when I was there, and now we're the, we're the Hawks, the Fighting Hawks. Uh, yeah, had a great great experience there at the University of North Dakota, uh, and I was a political science major. Um, and you know, just to, just to tell you a little bit about that, um, when I when I got to college, uh, my older sister uh, also went to UND, um, and she was uh, pre law, and so I thought, well, you know. I, I like the idea of going to law school. I like to read. I, I, some say I like to talk. So you get, you get kind of those two things together and uh, maybe that's interesting. And so um, when I was a junior, she entered law school and she called me six weeks into law school and said, Brooks, this is the worst decision I ever made. I'm, I'm leaving law school. And I thought, oh my goodness, well, I'm not sure I want to be a lawyer either. And that's, that's sort of the decision I made uh, where I said, hey, you know, I really think I want to ultimately go into business instead of law, but I'm already sort of, you know, pretty far along the path in political science. So I'm going to stay the course in poli sci, but I know I don't want to go to law school. And then the funny part about that is my sister, the next year went back to uh, uh, Billy Mitchell, William Mitchell, 
and St. Paul and, uh, you know, graduated with honors and, and, and all that stuff. So she ended up liking it, but I had already, she, she convinced me to not become a lawyer in that period of time. So maybe that's, she that's was just story snookering there. you. Was yeah. she snookering you? Yeah, no, she, 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 she absolutely did. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with my decision now, but at the time I was thinking, Oh my goodness, am I making the right decision? You know, and for all you sports fans out there, you got to go look back at the North Dakota Fighting Sioux moniker, which is in NCAA sports. Nobody had a better one. That was it. In fact, when they when they travel and they travel well for hockey, when they come play our Bulldogs over here, half of the, the whole stadium is green with the old moniker jerseys on. <laughs> yeah, they were they were they were nice for sure. So you go on and get an MBA after you finish your your political science degree. Where did you do yeah. that, and uh, and and what was your your thought pattern to go and go on and get the MBA? Yeah, no, great great question. So um, so so back it up a little bit. So when I graduated from UND, um, my first role out of school was I was working at the uh, the MJEX or the Minneapolis Grain Exchange in downtown Minneapolis on 4th and 4th, kind of by the old Metrodome for, for, uh, for folks from the Minneapolis area. Um, and uh, basically what the Minneapolis Grain Exchange was, is it, it was the uh, exchange of hard red spring wheat for the world. Um, and so it was, it was old school pit style trading, and it was a great experience and really tied in uh, with my family business background, uh, being in the ag industry. Very interesting uh, experience there. Um, I ultimately, you know, one of one of the big things I learned there was I did not want to be a day trader. That was not um, ultimately what I wanted to do with my career. Uh, and some people do it and do it very successfully, but that was not for me. Um, and so from there, I went and I took a role uh, working for the CFO uh, of a real estate finance and development company called Gemstone Development that was headquartered in Las Vegas, Nevada. So. Moved to moved to Las Vegas, had a really interesting experience there, working for some really smart people, uh, doing uh, doing really interesting stuff. Um, we were kind of in a in a time in real estate that was kind of 07, 08, where it was just a it was an absolute grind. Um, and so uh, you know the timing the timing there wasn't exactly right, but the experience I got as a twenty four year old was phenomenal. And one of the things I learned um, while I was there was. I needed to go back and, and beef up and strengthen my finance and my accounting if I wanted to um, do the things that, you know, I was starting to realize I wanted to do with my career. Um, and, um, you know, so the, the, as, as much as I love the poli sci degree, maybe there, maybe, maybe that uh, was, was part of the driver of it. And so I started applying to business schools um, and, uh, you know, I just, it was, I was really, really fortunate to get into Southern Methodist, uh, university in Dallas. It was just, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. So got, got, you know, got accepted there and, um, they didn't have to ask me twice. I'll put it that way. You know, I had a nephew, so I've been to that campus before. What a beautiful campus. I picked a, a nephew of mine up when I was in Dallas to have dinner with them. And I'm like, holy catfish! Is this ever a nice uh, campus yeah. on SMU? Yeah, and it and it, it gets it gets better all the time. I mean, when I was there, it was beautiful, 2009 to 2011. But I mean, there's been so much investment in the campus in the last decade, uh, and they've got um, they've got alums who are uh, sort of the standard bearers, and they 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 set the mark for uh, you know philanthropic endeavors. Uh, to, to the campus. So it's, it's really cool. Uh, and it's going to be fun to see them in the ACC this year too. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited to uh, probably for the first time to go to a football game. So you, you, you go from being a, a uh, North Dakota uh, fighting Sioux hockey fan to an MSU football fan. Yeah. 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 No, for sure. For sure. So let's talk about 2009. So you co-founded and became an active partner in Longwater. Tell us about that. Tell us what your thought pattern was about going into business. You talked about a family business. You went mm -hmm. out and got some experience working for some other companies in, in a couple yep. different industries. What was all behind, hey, I'm going to form my own company? Yeah, no, for, for sure. And 
And so, you know, if, if you go back, um, so I, I grew up, I grew up in a family business, which we'll, we'll touch on a little bit later. Uh, but I grew up in a family business, but, but more than that, I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. And when I think about, um, you know, the relatives of mine who've started businesses, um, the things that have been done, like I grew up, I grew up in an atmosphere of like, Hey, that's, that's completely possible. And that kind of thing is completely normal to be thinking about. Um, and, and then ultimately doing if, if, if it, if it seems like it makes sense. Um, and so that's sort of the, the, the background I came from. And then the other thing about that is, you know, one of the things that I learned um, early on was I liked family businesses. I liked, you know, founder backed businesses or entrepreneur backed businesses where, um, you know, for me, and, and everyone's different, but like the idea of, you know, probably going and, and, and working at Frito Olay's with, you know, 25,000 other folks is probably not, wasn't as appealing to me as, as, as being part of something that was a little bit smaller. Um, and so uh, when I got to Southern Methodist in Dallas, like I knew, um, you know, there was, there was, I was starting to kind of get that itch of, hey, you know, I want to do something. I'm not quite sure what it is yet, um, but, I, but I'd like to go out and, um, you know, get, get something going that's a little bit entrepreneurial. And, and then I had the, the, the good fortune uh, to connect with the guy who's been my business partner for the last 15 years, uh, Jordan Bastable. And Jordan grew up in Kansas City, went to TCU in Fort Worth, uh, and he and I were introduced actually when I joined. Um, I joined a church in Dallas right when I moved down there, and so he was he was involved in that church, and so we we got introduced. And I always like to tell the story. We I was I joined the church, and the lady said, "Hey, you should go out and have lunch with these young people and meet some young people in the church." And right when I met him, they're like, "It was a Sunday afternoon." They said, "Hey, we're not going to lunch. We're going to this bar, and we're going to crawfish boil." And I said. My goodness, I I joined a church to not go to the bar as much, and 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 they're going no 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 you're going to love it it's 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 crawfish boil so I got exposed to my first crawfish boil of my life, uh, and then also met my future business partner, uh, and then you know he and I connected first, built a friendship, you know went to some uh, went to some basketball games, um, and uh, became friends, but pretty quickly ascertained hey we've got similar business interests, and he was at the time working for. Uh, a business called Lineage Power, uh, which is a power transformer business in Mesquite, Texas, a suburb of Dallas. It was owned by, uh, it was a Tyco spin out owned by the Gores Group, which is a large private equity firm out of Los Angeles. And he was doing some interesting work, uh, but also work where he thought he spotted an opportunity, which is he was being asked to do a ton of outsourcing. So they were moving jobs to Mexico and Southeast Asia. And you know he was coming to this conclusion that, hey, Sometimes jobs do need to be outsourced, but there's a lot of times where there's opportunities to build products uh, here in the United States. And uh, you know, if you think about different reasons, there's products that need to be built in the United States because of national cons security concerns and regulations. There's products that need to be built here um, because of uh, complexity. You know, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that first business we bought and the complexity in certain circuit boards. Um, and then and there's Products that need to be built here because of lead times, uh, and there's a whole bunch of reasons to go along, uh, either in front of or ancillary to, um, hey, you want to you want to build things here or manufacture here because you know it's it's sort of waving the flag, United States reasons. So there's there's just there's a lot of business reasons why things need to be built here, um, and and he thought that was a good idea, and we ultimately did. Uh, and then you know my background was um, again with the family business where. Like we had spent a lot of time talking about this idea where lots of family businesses are have phenomenal cultures and are phenomenal with the customers they currently have, but have gotten past the point where they're no longer out there chasing new customers. And so our sort of um, theory or synopsis on that was, hey, is there an opportunity to go get involved with a great family business with great tradition and great people, but maybe has slowed down a little bit on the... Um, on the, hey, let's go win a new customer uh, front uh, and really create some value. Uh, and, and, and we thought there was. Is that the Arthur companies that you're talking about? Uh, the fa our, our family business? Yes. Yep. Can yep. you talk our a little bit about that? Because there's a lot of things that are going on at the same time here, Brooks. Yeah. And so, um, and just to, and just to, just to tie it together, so uh, my my family business that I grew up in was the Arthur Companies, 
Um, and so, you know, in the summertime grew up, um, you know, shoveling grain, cleaning out grain bins, all that stuff. Um, and then, uh, in 2013, so four years after kind of the period we're talking about, um, I moved back to North Dakota, uh, and took over my, took over my family business as the CEO, uh, which is the Arthur companies. But the first business that Jordan and I bought in 2013, uh, was a business uh, in Las Colinas, Texas, right outside Dallas, uh, called Circuitronics, which is a small uh, circuit board assembly business. Do you still hold that company? We don't. No, nope. we okay. sold. Yeah, so we so we bought that business in 2009, um, and you know, really interesting kind of transformative part of my career. And so, if you if you kind of take a step back, so early 2009. Um, or maybe mid 2009, Jordan and I made the decision to, hey, we want to do this. We want to go out. Uh, we want to buy a business, build this, build a business, and then hopefully ultimately build businesses. Um, and so we started looking around, uh, and we went out and we bought uh, a, a small circuit board assembly company. Um, again, called Circuitronics. Very small, 18 employees, three and a half million in revenue. Um, you know, about about a half million dollars in uh, EBITDA. Um, and, um, uh, and kind of, kind of took it from there. And, and my partner, Jordan became the CEO of that business almost right away. Um, and then, you know, over the course of five years, we were able to really grow the business, got it to 23 or 24 million in revenue. Um, and then, uh, ultimately sold it, uh, to a private equity firm. Um, and that's, uh, sort of the first kind of, um, deal we did. So, um, you know, when we founded it in 2009, we were technically a private equity firm, but in in, in reality, we were two guys that bought a business. Um, and when we were able to kind of go through that process, we kept seeing opportunities along the way and, and kept kind of, you know, getting more focused on the idea of we want to keep doing this and we want to do this at greater scale. Um, but doing that first deal allowed us to um, create a little street cred, if you will. Brooks, for our listeners who don't understand what private equity is about, can you explain the whole uh, yep. process of private equity? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, so if you, um, if, if you think about, if, if, if you take what most people would think about as um, any, any type of business in the country where there are shareholders, sometimes it's one individual, sometimes it's many, um, and a business runs and hopefully that business turns a profit and uh, it creates value for the shareholders and, 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 and move forward. Um, if, and then if you think about a stock that's traded or a publicly traded stock, which most people understand on the NASDAQ uh, or the NYMEX or, or whatever, what it might be, uh, or the New York Stock Exchange, um, where people can go buy it, uh, what a private equity firm does is we go out, we raise capital from individuals, from, from organizations like endowments, from organizations like universities, from pensions, um, from any number of any number of groups. We raise capital. Uh, we aggregate that capital, and then we go and we make investments into businesses. And, and from our from our standpoint, with our private equity. Uh, group, and I'm going to I'm going to differentiate that later in the podcast when we talk about the credit piece. Um, but we always do a control buyout, so we would then go in and we will buy a what we'll call a lower middle market, uh, and and everyone defines that differently. Uh, but we kind of define that as call it you know a wide range three to twenty five million dollars of EBITDA or earnings. Uh, we go in and we buy that business, and we try to. Uh, make it better in a, in a number of ways. Uh, but then ultimately the time will come when we sell that business. Um, and, and so our shareholders are people who've invested in us. And, it, and, and again, that might be, um, uh, that could be a pension that represents, you know, thousands of teachers. That could be a wealthy individual. It could be all of the above. And, and it usually is a mix of all of the above uh, from an investor base. Um, and, and so that's who ultimately, um, you know, we're, we're working for and, and are trying to drive returns for. Um, and so it, it's interesting that, um, 
sometimes private equity will have you know negative connotations that go with it. But if you step back and just think about you know the the people that run uh, uh, you know take a publicly traded company, you know take a 3M, take whatever it is, people that run a large corporation, um, they are responsive to their shareholders who ultimately look a lot like our shareholders. <laughs> And, um, it, it's, and so it's just, it, we're, we're able to do it in the, in the private markets or with non-publicly traded companies. Question for you, Brooks, is on every acquisition, are all of your partners in on every acquisition or do they get to choose, ah, I'm not interested in that market sector. I don't want to invest my, my part of the pie in that. How does that work for your firm? Yeah, great, great question. And the answer is all of, so when we raise a, a fund, so a lot of people have heard that term, but what actually is that, right? We, we raise a pool of capital um, and, and that pool of capital is invested. Uh, it, every investor in it is, is peri passu into every single deal that we go into in the appropriate way. So, you know, if somebody has a dollar in and somebody has 10 million in, you know, we're taking the appropriate slice from each one each time we do a deal. So the exposure is the same. Now everything has caveats. So there could be a situation where, you know, you have a, um, you know, somebody, you have an investor that represents a endowment that says, Hey, I could never invest in something that has an exposure to X, Y, or Z uh, in that situation, which we've never dealt with. Um, you might have a situation where, somebody is excused from an investment, but that would be, that's a decision that would make be made beforehand. Um, so the, 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 the quick answer is yes, everyone's in on every deal. Brooks, are they also on the board so they help make decisions or are they advisors or they are just simply, I shouldn't say simply because they're everything, right? They're the capital, right. are, are, they're investors. And then you are the board, you are managing all of that. Yeah, it, it, and, the, and the answer to that is it depends. In most cases, they are investors and they're not on the board and they're not part of the decision making process. And, and how I would how I would say that is most folks who choose to invest with us are underwriting us, and so they want to know once they've made a decision. Okay, I trust you. We're investing with you. They want to know that we're making the decisions, not some unknown investor. However. Um, we do have um, we do have a, um, uh, a group of strategic advisors who will lean on for advice, um, but they ultimately don't have any um, you know any formal decision making uh, authority, um, and uh, it, it's, and so that's how that works. So, Brooks, as Longwater builds up a a portfolio of of companies that you own. And people start finding out about your company and they're like, wait a minute, I would like to become an invest investor in Longwater. How does that work as, as your company grows and then your investor pool grows? Yeah. Yeah. No, great, great question. So, you know, what, what I would say, and, and um, you know, obviously that's one of our goals, right? We want to, we want to grow the firm. We want to create more opportunities for the people in the firm um, and uh, have more opportunities to acquire great assets. Um, but what I would say, one thing that we are really, really focused on is we are hiring ahead of the curve and we're building the infrastructure ahead of the curve to be to be ready for that. And I know, Tom, we're gonna we're gonna touch on a little bit um, uh, the private credit group we've recently brought over, uh, which we're really excited about. Uh, but I think it's just an example of us being ready for growth. Uh, and being ready to take that on. And so, you know, as we continue to scale, we're going to have the people, the processes, the back office, to be able to do that, do that effectively and, you know, continue to serve our shareholders uh, better. Brooks, how does, how does a transaction work then in the private equity world where, okay, you have found a customer, a, a, a company, if you will, that uh, it's like, hey, we, we like, that market and we like what we see possibly in the future with that market how do you pursue a company number one number two is how do you i guess convince a company to sell to a private equity and then how does all that transaction look like for 
not only the buy side, your side, but also the sell side, the, the people who are selling to you? Yeah. Yeah. For, for Great, great question. And this, I might get a little long winded here, Tom. So just stop me if, uh, stop me if you need to. So it, the, the way I would, the way, where, where I'd start answering that question is um, if you think about the industry today, pr private equity today, uh, the proliferation of competitors that we have today has never been greater. So, I mean, I think back to uh, when we started our firm in 2009 uh, till today, I mean, it's the, the market has gone from having three or 4,000 private equity firms out there to 14 or 15,000. So there are competitors everywhere. And to be successful, you need to be esoteric, niche, focused on something that you believe you can do and you could do well and you, you think you have an advantage at. So when I think about what we focus on, U.S. manufacturing, industrial, industrial services businesses, um, and and where we think we have edges there, that's that's that'd be the first thing I'd say. So we are not looking at a universe of every available company in the country to sell or that's for sale in a year. Absolutely not. We're looking ultimately at, at a very, very small uh, sector of that. And so the first thing I'd say is the business development side. So we want to be in front of every intermediary in the country on a quarterly basis. And, and when I say in front of, that doesn't mean, you know, we can't fly to all these people. There's four or 5,000 of them and meet with them every quarter, but email touches, phone calls, uh, you know, email blasts on what we're doing, things we're focused on. We want to be top of mind for any intermediary in the country who is selling a business within our segment. Uh, so that'd be the first thing I'd say. Um, and so you're out there finding these opportunities. The second thing is we're constantly trying to build relationships with business owners who are ultimately going to transact their business because, and, and this should be a shock to no one, lots of people out there, when they think about selling their business, don't want to go through a process where they hire an investment banker or they hire a broker and it's this nine month long process and they go through a bunch of stuff. If they find a partner that they can trust and they believe they're being treated fairly, they will transact with that group uh, without going through uh, a long process. And so we've been able to do that on multiple occasions uh, and expect to be able to continue uh, finding opportunities uh, like that. So you get, you get in there, you find a business that you like, you decide it makes sense for you. And we're, we're going through one right now where, um, you know, we've recently submitted an LOI, um, but you find a business that makes sense for you. You know, our message to the seller of the business, because I mean, think, think about in any market with a supply demand balance of the one I just described. If it's a good business, we're not the only people competing for this business. And um, so when we think about what our message is to the seller, you hit it on the head, like we have to sell ourselves. They're selling their business. We're selling ourselves as partners. And we have to do that for a couple of reasons. One, most people in the part of the market that we are buying businesses in, uh, the lower middle market, it, it's, a, it's a guy or a, guy, a man or a woman who's owned this business for 25 or 30 years. And you know they might have 200 or 300 employees there's a high likelihood that they know personally most of the employees, you know, some of them better than others. They're going to know the CFO. They're going to go fishing with that guy, but they will know the guy who's out on the line running the CNC machine. They'll know his first name, they'll know his wife's name, and they'll know his kids' names. So I mean, they care about these people. And so you have to let them know who you are, what your core values are, and why you will be a good steward, not just to their business, but the people who work there. And, and they're not, and generally a business owner isn't sitting there saying, hey, promise me that everyone who works here has a job forever. You know, this isn't Europe. But they are saying, show me a path where you have a vision to grow this business. And if you grow, the people who are here and work hard have a chance to continue growing with it. And that's what most people want to see. They want to see that you are going to, or I should say, they want to know that you are going to do everything you can to ensure the, the business name, which sometimes literally is the family name, you know, it's, it's the last name of the person, or if it's not in the town they live in is synonymous with their last name. They want to make sure you're not going to run it through the mud. Okay. So that is, that is super important uh, to, to people, uh, to people selling a business. 
Um, and so letting them know who we are, letting them know about our core values. You know, when I'm talking to people, I'm always telling them about my family business background, you know, just explaining when they're talking about, hey, you know, we've had, you know, Tom Smith has been with us for 40 years. I always love to tell the story where we've had uh, a, a family where uh, Grandpa Torque was with the family, like starting in 1935, all the way through his son and then a nephew where like we love that stuff and that that stuff really resonates with me. So just tying all that stuff together, building a relationship and then talking about a strategy where, hey, here is our plan over the next five or six or seven years where, where we think we can grow this business. How do you guys as ownership and you guys as management, how, what do you think about that? And can we come together and be collaborative? Because if we come in there and say, here's what we're going to do, we're going to go do this. And the CEO and the management team is like, no, no, that's the wrong plan. We are going to lose. And so, and that's going to be a bad outcome for us and for the seller and everybody. So we don't want any part of that. Uh, and then and then the last piece I'd say on why you have to build that relationship is because in the lower middle market, we're almost undoubtedly going to be asking the seller to roll over some of their equity. So, hey, we want you to roll. 10% of your ownership, 15%, 20%, and effectively become our partner. And, um, you know, we're then going to go over the next, uh, you know, period of time and, and hopefully grow what you've started into something even bigger. So they have got to trust you uh, and to trust someone. They've got to get to know you and they've got to see you and they've got to see your values and you've got to share them to be able to do that. Uh, so that's a big part of it. Uh, and then when you talk about like how the transaction actually works, so, you know, we'll go in, you um, you know, put together um, an IOI, which is a an acronym for indication of interest, send it to the potential seller. Um, if, if we're kind of, everyone's in sort of the same um, ballpark and they're going, hey, you're, you're in the right range. Um, then we go in and do another few weeks worth of work on it. Uh, we'll do a lot of expert calls. Uh, we'll try and learn as much as we can about the industry. And which which at that period of time, that's really where you're focused and, you know, your ability to learn more about the business is you, you're still able to learn a lot, but it, it's, it's limited at that point. Um, and then we'll come in and, and submit an LOI or a letter of intent. If we're accepted or selected to buy the business, that's when our team and, and, and third party groups that we hire. So you've got you've got legal, you've got a quality of earnings group that you'll bring in. Um, you've got to do uh, a few other things on that front, but really those are all check the box stuff. What you're doing and where your energy is really focused is business diligence. Is this a good business? Is this what I think it is? Um, and can we take it from A to B uh, and, and, and create a positive result for our shareholders, for the employees uh, and for the customers of this business as well? Um, and if we can, if we can do all that, um, you know, then that's something we're, we're excited about. Brooks, the landscape has really changed since March of 2020. I'm assuming that your industry has changed as much as we, the some of us, the manufacturer. Obviously, you're an owner of companies and and uh, as a private equity, so you're a manufacturer and you see it on, on your end with a lot of your companies. How has the private equity, we're buying companies or the private equity, we're going to sell some of our portfolio changed for you, specifically in the American manufacturing, because uh, that I literally circled that the first time you said it, because that's what we are. And I'd love to hear that. How has that landscape changed for you? Let's talk first on the buy side. You're, you're looking at manufacturing companies that we know that the economy's not most wonderful right now. Interest rates are sky high. And these are all working against the positive portfolio or the, the, the positive uh, financial statements on your me, medium to small manufacturing companies. Yeah, no, it's, it's great. What, what I would say is, you know, I remember uh, March of 2020 like it was yesterday. Um, and what what was really interesting, and, and, and Tom, I'm sure you remember this too, is it felt like um, you you could have two businesses, both well run, good businesses, and one got hit in the head with a baseball bat, and the other got sent to meteoric heights. You know, like like there's these 
there's these artificial winners and losers that were selected in, in what one might argue was an artificial economy for, for a period of time. Um, and what was, what was really interesting is watching uh, people and teams battle and, and fight through some really dark times. And, and you know, I mean, we had a couple of businesses uh, in the market or, or, or that we owned at that time, which are which were and are great businesses that got absolutely hammered uh, with COVID. And, you know, one of them as an example was a business that curates, creates, and manufactures artwork with our biggest end market being hospitality and our second biggest end market being cruise ships, right? So, you know, I probably don't need to tell you kind of about, about all the pain and suffering there, but, but able to watch teams work together, come together, work in a super cohesive way and dig in their heels and lean in uh, and solve problems was a was a, a frankly inspiring uh, inspiring time to be part of our organization and and, and watch our team pull together at that time um, was was fantastic. Um, but but fast forwarding a little bit, Tom, to, to I think the question you're asking, which is just sort of what are what are we seeing today, kind of in in, in a post COVID world of view where we've got interest rates where they are uh, and uncertainty in the economy. What I would say. Is, is that really good assets are as expensive or more expensive than they've ever been. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you've got a business that has a diversified, you know, blue chip customer base, where you maybe you've got some long-term contracts, you've got high margins, you've got a good management team, that business, if you wanted to buy that business today, is more expensive than it ever was, ever. Forget interest rates. That business is, is, is super expensive. Um, once you move below that, um, you know, being able to transact at all without um, kind of onerous terms on you as a seller where people might say, hey, we're interested in this business. You know, the management team is shaky. Um, we, you know, we want you to roll over 45% of your equity or, or something like that. And I'm using maybe an extreme example, but um, the, the really good assets have gotten more expensive. Um, Below that uh, is where you really see the effect of people saying, hey, look, we've got high interest rates. We've got a shaky economy. I just can't be certain about this company. I've got to put uh, guardrails to protect myself in the event of uh, you know, A, B, or C happening. How about on the sell side for you uh, since COVID? Because you not only buy companies in your portfolio, but, yep. but you, you also sell some of those companies. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, a, a, an example that's the flip side of what I just described, where we had a couple companies that were really punished uh, during COVID, is we had a business that, um, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't say that it it it's the only reason it did well was COVID. That's just not true. But it was in um, uh, building cabinets, or excuse me, building products, and we did cabinets. Uh, th think of kitchen cabinetry. Um, and we're doing it in the Mountain West, and so you had this big exodus of people from a California. Uh, or the really restrictive COVID lockdown areas uh, to places like, um, uh, you know, like uh, Idaho, like Utah, where this business was based, um, you know, down into Nevada. And, um, you know, I think we benefited some uh, from that. Uh, and so had some tailwinds with that business. And we, we actually sold that business uh, in, um, uh, in 2021. So, I mean, still... Yeah, I mean, it was still in, I don't want to say the heart of COVID, but it was still COVID time at that period of time um, and uh, had a really good outcome um, with that business. So we were we were happy to, uh, you know, happy to see that. But I think, you know, if, if I had to go back to this one theme and something we have learned as a firm and we have gotten so much better at today than we were when we started, which is it all comes back to leadership. You are underwriting the leadership of a business uh, when you're buying a business and you've got to get that part right. Um, and, and you know, so, so when we're looking at a business now, if we don't like that leadership team, gosh, it would take a heck of a lot to get us to, to, to say, hey, we really want to get involved with this business. Whereas, you know, five or six or seven years ago, when we had a little less experience, we might have said, well, you know, it's a great business and we can bring somebody in to do this. And, and that, that's, that to me is what it comes back to. And if you've got a really strong leadership team, um, you're going to, you're going to get a lot of people attracted to, to your business.
Folks, today our special guest is Brooks Burgum, co-founder and partner at Longwater Private Equity. Brooks, can you do us a favor for our listeners, people who might be small business owners who are thinking of exit strategies, that how the, how can they find you? What are your social handles? What's your website so they can find you and your team? Yeah, no, that's that's great. And so um, you can you, you, p- please do reach out um, if, if you have a business and um, if you're interested in having a discussion. And so you can find us at um, www.longwateropportunities.com. Um, that'd be, that'd be the main place. We're also on LinkedIn. Uh, and then, um, you can always, uh, just shoot me an email direct, uh, to brooks at lwops.com. That's brooks at L W O P P S.com. Uh, love to, love to hear from you and, um, yeah, lo- love to have a conversation. We'll end with that again. So people can, can reach out. <clears throat> Question I have is, you know, I've owned some companies and, and there's, there's different ways to to buy and sell companies. There's obviously a multiple of earnings, right? Um, which most business owners would know about because they deal with earnings. Uh, but then there's also where you can get into asset purchases of companies. Do you work on both ends of those? Or are you really looking at uh, buying based on a, a uh, multiple of earnings? Yeah, so... We we generally work off of multiple of earnings, and uh, you know sometimes uh, ultimately that'll, that'll be structured legally as an asset purchase. Um, but but the but the multiple of earnings uh, question it, it, it is one we work off. And, and I mean there there are Tom a couple of different ways to do that. So there are uh, you know you'll see businesses, and I've got you know a relative and venture capital, and I mean they're they're oftentimes valuing businesses off of multiples of revenue. Um, which is always uh, kind of shocking to me when I talk to them about it and we sort of kick around numbers. Um, but uh, you, you know they'll 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 value it off of multiple of revenue. Um, there are uh, you know there are people who look at it um, and, and say, hey, you know what's the book value? Let's look at a multiple of book value. That's a lot of times how banks transact. Um, but when we think about uh, the businesses we're in, it's generally a multiple. Uh, it, 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 it's the 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 lingua the, the lingo that's spoken in our industry is a multiple of EBITDA, um, and um, you know that that takes you know there, there's a wide range of that depending on a wide range of factors. Brooks, tell us about a, a new I believe it's a new venture called Private Credit Group. Yes, um, so yeah, happy happy to talk about this. Get get excited talking about this one. So. Um, to, to give you to give you a little bit more more color, and so um, Longwater historically, which I've kind of we, we've talked about here, Tom, over the last hour, uh, has invested as a control equity uh, buyout purchaser of lower middle market manufacturing industrial industrial services businesses. Um, one thing that my co-founder Jordan and I have noticed, you know, over the last five or six years are the opportunities to stay in the lower middle market, but expand beyond just buyout control equity and offer our investors uh, a different position in the capital stack or a different risk profile, if you will. Um, and uh, you know, five or six years ago, uh, we got to know um, the leader of a group, um, a gentleman named Kevin Pronti, um, uh, who's working for a different organization at the time. Um, and really started to build a relationship. Um, ultimately, here this last year, um, he and seven colleagues uh, made the move and, and joined us at Longwater. Uh, and we now have a, a group called Longwater Capital Solutions. Uh, and what they do, uh, which we think is really interesting um, in the lower middle market, is um, we, we take capital and we invest uh, as equity, a little bit of capital into a number of different lower middle market industry and sector leading private equity firms across the country. So as an example, there might be a firm uh, that's that's really good in aerospace and defense. There might be another firm that's really good in healthcare services. Uh, there might be another firm that's really good in business services. Um, and we will go out and, and we will invest into their firm. 
Um, then when those firms go out and buy businesses uh, in the lower middle market, they generally use debt to fund those purchases or some amount of debt. And building relationships with those firms, we then hope to be in a really good position to be the debt provider uh, during those acquisitions. And if you step back and think about it from the perspective of uh, when you're lending money, it's getting to know the owner or the person you're, you're lending to, and then it's getting to know the underlying asset that you're lending against. And we like to think that you know, we have the first part covered uh, because they've had a decades long relationship uh, with these groups that we're, that we're lending to. Uh, so when we think about tying that together um, and, and as a firm betting on something, which is ultimately our belief that the individual investor over the next eight or 10 years in America is gonna have more opportunity to invest in alternative assets and what I mean by an alternative asset is a private equity firm, a venture capital firm, a private credit group, um, a private real estate group. There's going to be more opportunities. Whereas today, the vast amount of investors in America, it could be you know a teacher with an account at um, a local brokerage or whoever it might be, can only invest in very kind of vanilla stocks and bonds. And and you know if you look at someone's 401k. 401k opportunities, it's, it's, you know, it's pretty mundane and it's all publicly traded. And our belief is that's going to change. And we think we're creating something here uh, that's going to be really well suited for an investor that's for the first time maybe stepping out of, hey, I've owned, you know, my husband and I have owned stocks and bonds our whole lives. And, and we want to put $200,000 into something else. We're creating a product that has that is mostly credit, mostly senior secure credit, and then it's really diversified on the equity piece, um, where they're getting a um, a ton of access to um, um, a bunch of different underlying assets, uh, and they're getting again mostly credit product to keep the to keep the risk down, um, and there's also going to be a liquidity aspect to it and quarterly uh, mark to markets. Um, and it's just, it's something that we're really excited about uh, as we really lean into this idea of, again, the private investor and their desire to invest in alternative assets. So if I heard you correctly, this new private credit group within your organization is potentially, if, if, if every other private equity out there is a competitor, you're investing in some of your competitors out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're, and we're excited to do so. And again, if you think about what our control buyout or our private equity group does, our focus is very niche. It's U.S. manufacturing, industrial, industrial services. We're going to be investing in, in private equity firms uh, across the spectrum who are sector experts in other areas. And so if we're going to, you know, if, if you think about this long order capital solutions group, they're going to be providing credit or a loan on a deal. The person who's running that deal, if it's a healthcare services business, we think that the best people in the country who know healthcare services are going to be running that. Uh, and that's just that's just an example. So um, yeah, we're, we're we're going to be absolutely. That's, that's a great way to put it, Tom. What's the favorite part of your job? <laughs> I I think it's um, I. I think it's getting to uh, build an organization. And, you know, for so long, my co-founder and I, when we started this business, we're very focused on, hey, we're buying these businesses and, and you, you know, you're, you're putting out fires every day and you're doing all sorts of stuff that we never got to step back and really spend time on building the business. And, and we're at a point now at a, at a size and scale where we get to think strategically about our firm and our business, which is really exciting and fun and, and get to, um, you know, see all these great people who have worked so hard uh, to make this business be successful, uh, succeed. And for anybody, for anybody who's ever ran or owned a business, they understand this. Like when you have people who've been there in the trenches with you and work super hard for a long period of time, like you want to see them succeed more than you want that even for yourself. So it's, it's been, that part's been pretty rewarding. 
is the stereotypical thought about private somebody who wants to get into private equity uh, as a career that you better strap your boots on tight because uh, it's a lot of work and a lot of long hours and one heck of a lot of commitment that you're going to have to put in. Yeah, I think I think I think that's right. And um, what, what I would what I would say too is is, is for for and I always I always tell you know young folks or kids whoever if I'm talking to somebody about it is is if you if you want to be in this industry just make sure you want to be in it for the right reasons because it is super long hours it's super hard work and you know I think that I think that maybe there's an idea and and I think this was true in the 80s and 90s for the people that basically invented the business like there was these you know amazing arbitrage opportunities where sort of overnight things happened like that's not the reality of what we do right you 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 go in you buy a business you work super hard for years to try and improve it incrementally um and then and then you keep doing that and um you know so just thinking about what you really want to do uh cuz i think there's a lot of people who might say oh, i really want to be in this and really what they want to do is they want to go buy a small business and and run that business uh or or do um a, a number of different things and so um Yes, but if someone does decide they want to want to do it, um, you, you've got to work super hard, and you're entering an industry that's that's more competitive than ever. So, folks, our special guest today is Brooks Burgum, co-founder and partner at Longwater Private Equity. Give us those social handles and your email again, so anyone out there who's thinking, you know, maybe I ought to think about an exit strategy one of these days for my small business. How can they find you, Brooks? Yeah, absolutely. P please look us up. Um, you, you can find us online at www.longwateropportunities.com. Uh, you can reach me uh, at my email at brooks at lwops.com. That's B-R-O-O-K-S at Larry Walter Othello, Peter Peter Sam .com. Um, Or you can find us on LinkedIn as well. Um, so we'd love, love, love to hear from you. Love to talk to you. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's how you reach us. So, you know what? I can't believe this went this fast because I have a lot more questions for you, but we're going to get cut off here soon enough. But I would be remiss if I didn't go personal on you on our pack questions segment. Yes. And so we're just going to find out what the, the founder and owner of a private equity, what the heck do they do to watch a fun movie? What's your favorite? Uh, my, my favorite, my favorite movie ever is, is called The Edge, uh, with Anthony Hopkins. And so, um, uh, anyway, my favorite movie. Favorite place that Brooks has ever traveled? Uh, Vietnam. What brought you to Vietnam? Uh, it was, it was actually with a, a global leadership program between years at business school and uh phenomenal experience. So yeah, it was, it was great. It's been about a week there. I've heard many people say that. What is your biggest fear? I mean, in your industry, you have to be pretty fearless. What's your <laughs> biggest fear? Heights. When I was a kid, I used to, uh, we'd have to get on top of grain bins and my palms were sweating constantly and they still do today. So heights. Maybe, maybe that's why when you went to to uh, UND, you didn't go into the aviation program. <laughs> that, 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 that might be it. That might be it. <laughs> uh, favorite band? Or artist? Uh, Dean Lewis or James Taylor. And what is the best piece of life advice that Brooks Burgum has ever received? Um, I, you know, I think it'd have to be, uh, you know, somebody told me life, life moves really fast. Invest in relationships, friendships, and uh, in, in, in people you care about. Just invest the time. To, uh, to keep those relationships going and keep them strong because they can they can fade. Don't let them. Brooks, great advice. And folks, our special guest today is Brooks Burgum, co-founder and partner at Longwater. If any of you are thinking about exit strategies, whether you're getting old or just, hey, I've run my business long enough, I'm burned out, look up the folks at Longwater. They'll take care of you and... Uh, and hopefully you can uh, ride off into the sunset. Brooks, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you very much, Tom. Really appreciate it. And folks, until next time.
Make sure that you unplug from the indoors and that you recharge in the outdoors.